Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and I'm out here at the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum in Shiloh, Manitoba, having a look at some of the fantastic weapons they have on display in their outdoor park. This is a 30 centimeter Raketenwerfer 56, and this is one of many types of rocket artillery deployed by the German military during the Second World War. Now, before we get started with this video, I do want to warn you that this particular weapon was developed very late in the war and is one in a long line of previous developments. We have a lot of history to go over before we even get to this example, so buckle in. Now, the development of German rocket artillery in the interwar period was sparked by a number of major factors, the main one being the 1919 Treaty of Versailles, which banned Germany from developing long-range artillery. However, it said nothing about rockets, and so in 1929, Lieutenant Karl Becker of the German Army Ordnance Office launched a project to develop rocket artillery in order to skirt this prohibition. Now, Becker was most interested in using rocket artillery to saturate an enemy position with large quantities of poison gas. And since chemical warfare was also explicitly banned by the Treaty of Versailles, it goes to show how serious the Germans really were about following the letter of the law. Indeed, during this period, Germany was developing all sorts of prohibited weapons at secret sites both in Germany and in neighboring countries, particularly the Soviet Union. Now, Becker's program was carried out at the Army Proving Grounds at Kummersdorf and initially succeeded in creating a 73mm rocket for dispersing propaganda leaflets, which we'll have a look at in a little while. Later, in 1931, they purchased some commercial rocket motors and added a warhead to create the 11 centimeter Rauchspergerät or smoke trail device, which had an effective range of 46 kilometers or 29 miles. However, these were only ever used for training and never saw actual combat. Now, the second major reason for the Germans developing rocket artillery was practical battle experience. You see, at the beginning of the war, the Germans thought that the use of close infantry support aircraft, like the Junkers 87 Stuka dive bomber, would replace conventional long-range artillery. However, following the invasion of the Soviet Union, the Germans found themselves facing large, fast batteries of Soviet long-range artillery, and at the time, Germany didn't have the production capacity to produce the large number of long-range artillery pieces needed to respond to this threat, and so they turned to rockets as a more cost-effective alternative. They were also very impressed by the Soviet use of the Katusha, or rocket launcher, and wanted to replicate this capability. Now, throughout the war, rocket artillery was mainly deployed by the so-called Nebeltruppen, or smoke troops, who were initially formed in order to carry out chemical warfare attacks. However, since chemical warfare really wasn't used during the Second World War, they were instead given charge of rocket artillery deployment. And this is similar to how the U.S. Army Chemical Corps was originally founded in order to carry out chemical warfare attacks, but was later put in charge of incendiary weapons like flamethrowers. Now, the Nebeltruppe's first dedicated weapon was the 10 centimeter Nebelwerfer 35, which was a conventional mortar for launching smoke and chemical bombs out to ranges of 3,000 meters or 9,800 feet. However, they wanted even greater range, and in the summer of 1940, they received the larger 10 centimeter Nebelwerfer 40, which had a range of 6,350 meters or 20,800 feet. Then, in 1941, the Nebeltruppen received their first dedicated rocket weapon, the 15 centimeter Nebelwerfer 41. Now, it's important to note here that the name Nebelwerfer literally translates to smoke thrower or fog thrower, and originally this was a code name meant to conceal the actual purpose of these weapons, but which just kind of stuck. Now, the 15 centimeter Nebelwerfer 41 consisted of a cluster of six sheet metal barrels mounted on a modified 3.7 centimeter Pac-36 anti-tank gun carriage. Each launch tube had a set of internal rails both to siphon it and reduce the internal diameter, allowing it to fire the 15 centimeter Werfgranat 41. This was propelled by a solid rocket motor consisting of a bundle of seven sticks of nitrodiglycol, a form of nitrocellulose explosive. The motor was ignited electrically, with the flash being conveyed to the head of the fuel grain by a piece of quick match running up a central celluloid tube. The rocket exhaust was vented through 26 venturi, drilled at a 14 degree angle, which imparted a stabilizing spin of 1,000 to 1,500 RPM. Now, early on, the Germans rejected the use of simple stabilizing fins, and nearly all of their rocket artillery weapons used spin stabilization, a very German thing to do. And unfortunately, it made the rockets very expensive and time-consuming to produce, and greatly reduced the numbers that could be manufactured by the end of war. 
Now, the Wolfgangat 41 had a very unusual design in that it was built upside down, with the warhead, which could carry 6 kilograms or 14 pounds of TNT, smoke composition, or chemical warfare agents, being located behind the rocket motor in Venturi. So this was done so that when the rocket impacted, its warhead would be above ground rather than burying itself in the ground for maximum blast effect. So this turned out to be something of a temperamental design and was not copied on subsequent Nebelwerfer models. Now the rockets were ignited electrically, and while the Nebelwerfer 41 didn't have single fire capability, the rockets were launched in a staggered ripple so that the recoil from the rockets wouldn't tip the entire launcher over. And these rockets were fired in opposite pairs so that the heat and the recoil from adjacent pairs firing wouldn't warp the launch tubes. Now, the rockets themselves had a range of around 6,900 meters or 22,600 feet, with the circular error probable, the area within which 50% of the rounds would be expected to fall, being 500 by 130 meters in size. As a result, Nebelwerfer were typically deployed in batteries of around 6 to 12 launchers to completely saturate an area with explosives. Now, these rockets made an ungodly noise as they flew, leading to the Allies nicknaming them Screaming Mimi or Moaning Mini. They also produced a large amount of smoke, which quickly gave away the position of the battery. So the Nebeltruppen had to be very adept at clearing the area before counter-battery fire could be aimed upon them, a technique today known as Shoot and Scoot. Now, by the end of the war, a little over 5,000 Nebelwerfer 41s and half a million Wiffgranat 41 rockets were produced. But while the launcher costs around one-fifth as much as a roughly equivalent 10.5 centimeter light Feldhabitze, an example of which the museum has in its park, the rockets themselves were far more expensive on a per-unit basis than conventional artillery shells. From 1943 onwards, around 300 10-barrel versions called the Panzerwerfer 42 were also produced for mounting on half-tracks and ammunition tractors. Finally, a lightweight single-barrel version known as the Dogeret, after the head of the German rocketry program's Major General Walter Dornberger, was developed for use by airborne troops, but it appears not to have been widely deployed. Now, the next major rocket weapons to enter German service were the 28cm Wurfkoffer Spreng and the 32cm Wurfkoffer Flamme. Introduced in 1941, these had a more conventional layout with the rocket motor below the warhead. The 28cm rocket had a range of 1,925 meters or 6,300 feet and carried a 50 kilogram or 110 pound high explosive warhead, while the 32cm rocket had a range of 2,200 meters or 7,200 feet and could carry 50 liters or 13 gallons of incendiary oil, enough to set 200 square meters or 2,100 square feet of battlefield ablaze. Now, unlike the Nebelwerfer 41, these were not used for long-range bombardment, but rather as shorter ranges for taking out hard points like bunkers and pillboxes. Now, the rockets came packed in special wooden crates, which could double as the launch frame. And these could be propped up on simple bipods or mounted on special frames for abreast. And there were two different versions of this. The Schwere Wurfgerät 40, made of wood, and the Schwere Wurfgerät 41, made of metal. A special system of brackets called the Wurfrahmen 40 was also produced for mounting six launching crates to the side of the SDKFZ-251-1 or captured French Geniette UE half-tracks, three to a side. Now, due to its use as an infantry close support weapon and the sound that it made, German troops nicknamed the Wurfrahmen the Stuka zu Fuss, or the Walking Stuka, or the Heulende Kuh, or Bellowing Cow. Now, all these various launch methods only allowed for fairly crude aiming, and so a dedicated launcher, known as the 28-32cm Nebelwerfer 41, was also produced. This could launch six 28- or 32cm Wurfkofer rockets, though special adapter rails had to be fitted to accommodate the smaller rockets. 345 of these launchers were produced by the end of the war. Now, interestingly, in June 1941, the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, conducted tests to see if Wurfkopfer rockets could be successfully deployed from a U-boat. And these tests were carried out in the Baltic, and they discovered that these rockets could successfully be launched both surfaced and submerged. However, they were not accurate enough to hit anything but a stationary target, so they couldn't be used against things like Allied convoys and could only be used for shore bombardment. In addition, they were found to make the U-boat very unstable in roll, and so by the end of 1941, the project was cancelled. 
Now, the next development in German rocket artillery was the 21-centimeter Wefgranat 42, designed to replace the older 15-centimeter Wefgranat 41. In addition to having a more conventional layout with the rocket motor behind the warhead, the Wefgranat 42 also had a heavier 10-kilogram or 22-pound warhead and a greater range of 7,850 meters or 25,750 feet. Now, to launch this new rocket, the Germans developed the Nebelwerfer 42, which was nearly identical to the Nebelwerfer 41, but had five larger launch tubes instead of six. 1,400 launchers and 400,000 rockets were produced before the end of the war. Now, the Wurfgranat 42 was also deployed by the Luftwaffe as the Wurfgranat 21 for use against Allied bomber formation, and was launched from a simple tube mounted underneath the wings of interceptors such as the Messerschmitt Bf-109 and the Focke-Wulf 190. However, the rockets had such a severe ballistic drop that the launch tubes had to be angled upwards at 15 degrees to compensate. This generated a lot of drag and severely reduced the performance of the aircraft, making them very vulnerable to Allied fighter escorts. The rockets themselves are also not very accurate. However, when they did hit, they were extremely effective with the blast being capable of taking down an entire bomber with a single shot. Now, the last major development in German rocket artillery was the 30-centimeter Wurfkofer 42, which was designed to replace the older 28 and 32-centimeter Wurfkofer rockets. It had a slightly smaller explosive payload of 45 kilograms or 99 pounds, but a greater range of 4,550 meters or 14,900 feet. Improved aerodynamics and accuracy and reduced smoke production from the motor, making it harder for enemy troops to locate the launching battery. The rocket was launched using the 30 centimeter Nebelwerfer 42, which was simply a 28 32 centimeter Nebelwerfer 41 modified to fit the new projectile. However, only around 700 launchers and 200,000 rockets were produced before the end of the war. And this is because the Germans found that this design didn't provide that much more advantage over earlier rockets. And in order to economize on resources, they decided to build a rocket launcher that could take both this new rocket and older rockets in order to use up existing stocks. And that finally brings us to the Raketenwerfer 56. This was introduced in 1944 and is effectively a 30 cm Nebelwerfer 42 mounted on a 5 cm Pac-38 anti-tank gun carriage. Like the Nebelwerfer 42, this can launch the 30 cm Wurfkorfer 42 Spring, but it can also be fitted with adapter rails, as we see here, to fit older 15 cm Wurfgranat 41. And when not in use, these rails would be removed and stored in these brackets at the top. So this is a very simple weapon. There's actually not a whole lot to go over in terms of design details. On this side, we have a connector for our firing mechanism. And this is connected by a couple of conduits to our firing contacts at the rear. As you can see, these pull out and hinge over so you can load the rockets in and then complete the contact with the fuses on the motors. On the other side, we have our sight for aiming. We have some tools for moving the entire carriage around and we have our elevation wheel. Now, around 694 of these launchers were produced before the end of the war, and this particular example, the only one of its kind in Canada, was collected at the end of the war by one Captain Farley Mowat, who would later go on to become one of Canada's most beloved environmentalists and authors. And he was part of a special team assigned to bring back German weapons for display in Canadian museums. And among the items that he collected were a Flakpanzer Wöbelwind, which is currently under restoration at CFB Borden in Ontario. And I actually got to visit the workshop a couple of months ago, as well as a V-2 ballistic missile. And the story of how he managed to get that particular item back to Canada is absolutely hilarious. And I've detailed it in a video I wrote for Today I Found Out, which I have linked in the description. Now, those are the major types of rocket artillery deployed by the Germans during the Second World War, but there were a couple of others. For example, the Waffen-SS developed the 8 cm raketen Villachtwerfer, which was a near-exact copy of the Soviet Katyusha multiple rocket launcher. Only around 300 were produced and is not known how many saw combat. The Army also deployed small numbers of Propagandawerfer 41, a small single-rail tubular steel launcher designed for distributing propaganda leaflets. Now, unlike the previous Nebelwerfer projectiles, the Propagandagranat 41 was ignited not electrically but by a percussion cap. So the rocket was held in the front part of the launch rails by a pin, and when this pin was removed by pulling on a lanyard, the rocket would slide back and strike its percussion cap against a fixed firing pin, rather like a regular mortar. But, like the other Nebelwerfer projectiles, it was spin-stabilized using angled venturis, and after a certain delay, a small gunpowder charge would ignite, ejecting the capsule in the front and allowing the propaganda leaflets to fly out and float down over enemy territory. 
Now, later, a warhead was fitted to this rocket to allow it to be used in the 35 rail Fernguerret anti-aircraft launcher. And the last major German rocket artillery weapon worth mentioning is the 380mm Raketenwerfer 61 L5.4, fired by the Sturmpanzer heavy assault vehicle. Designed to take down heavy fortifications, the projectile contained a 376 kilogram or 829 pound high explosive or shape charge warhead with a range of 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet and able to penetrate 2.5 meters or 8 feet of reinforced concrete. Now this weapon was designed to be breech loaded, but the rocket exhaust could not be vented into the superstructure, so instead it was vented out a series of holes on the outside ring of the muzzle. Now, only 18 Sturm Tigers were ever produced, and they saw action during the Warsaw Uprising, the Ardennes Offensive, and the final Battle of Berlin. And that, dear viewers, is a brief overview of the German rocket artillery systems of the Second World War. Now, I'm sure I missed a couple of obscure systems, but I think that is a fairly comprehensive overview. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and thank you to the Royal Artillery Museum here for allowing me to make videos about their fantastic collection. I'll see you next time on another video where I'll look at yet more fantastic artillery and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.